Our readings, especially the first reading from the prophet Amos and then the gospel from Mark, speak about being chosen and being sent. I'd like to look at the readings with you and then draw out three points. First, the prophet Amos. Amos is probably the most blunt of all the prophets in condemning what kings and governments do, especially ripping off the poor and committing any number of injustices. What we read here is like entering into the middle of a shouting match. There's a big stew going on between Amos, whom God called from what? Tending sycamore trees. Now, what do you do when you tend sycamore trees? Watch them grow? I, I don't know. And, and then also uh, taking care of some sheep, shepherding. This is not coming from rabbinic school. He's chosen to do this. Amaziah is running the king's cathedral. It's like the national cathedral. It's a center for patriotism, not for people that come and criticize the government. So there's a very clear conflict going on here. And that's why Amaziah says, get out of here, which is translated off with you. Visionary, flee to the land, go home. Flee to the land, go back where you came from. There, earn your bread by prophesying, but never again, I don't want to hear you here. It would be like someone ascending the National Cathedral's pulpit in Washington, D.C., and starting on a long, harsh criticism of the government. Somebody would say this is just a, this is incongruous. We shouldn't do that. And, and indeed, it's rarely done. And Amos answers, he says, I'm, I'm not a prophet. Don't, don't accuse me. The Lord called me. Now, any of you have ever met people who say the Lord called me? You, I, I've met a few who feel called, and I said, I don't think it's the Lord, and I could be wrong. But think of, think of how powerful a call, an authentic call, really is. Go back to last Sunday, and here we have a reading from the prophet Ezekiel. As the Lord spoke to me, the Spirit entered ent into me and set me on my feet. Get up. I want you to do something. So here you have Amos doing the same thing, told where to go. He was, he was happy doing what he was doing. He didn't ask for this, right? Right. So this is an important thing to have in your mind as we go to the gospel. Now, in, in this particular text, keep in mind last Sunday, the gospel last Sunday was what? Uh-huh. Anybody remember the gospel last Sunday? Can I have a show of hands? Is the World Cup occupying your mind? What is the problem here? Last Sunday, it was Jesus returning to his home, Nazareth, preaching, and the people said, where did he get all this? Isn't he a carpenter's son, a techniker, not a rabbi? They found him entirely too much. So in other words, last Sunday, this is the, the, the text right before this one. Jesus is rejected. So when he tells the disciples, I'm going to send you forth, he's actually demonstrated, uh, you know, <laughs> what's going to happen to you. You better pay attention. So look at the reading. It says, I'm going to send you. I'm summoned. Summoned. It's not I'm inviting or please, would you come with me? It, they're summoning. There is a kind of experience that happens every once in a while, which is really very powerful. For the most part in my life, I just get inklings. I don't get a summons except for jury duty. But this is a crystallization of something that is very deep, even if not often seen clearly. And send them out two by two, two by two, because by Jewish law, if you want to establish the truth of something, you have to have a witness, not just one person. And then it says, it's worth looking at the details of the gospel, because they're very unusual that it would be such a detailed protocol for what you should do as a prophet or going forth as an apostle it says nothing on the journey but a walking stick no food no sack no money in their belts i just try to picture this it adds on 
They were to wear sandals, but not a second tunic. What's the deal? The deal is, you better go simply, or nobody's going to believe you're really doing something special. Depend, Jesus is saying, depend on me. He's not asking for a feasibility study. He's saying, depend on me. And of course, he wants them to use their wits. It's not like be stupid and so on. But trust in me. Second tunic would be something you'd use perhaps as a tent at night. huh? But he says right next to this, he says, go to the house and wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave. That almost sounds like Yogi Berra. Wherever you go, stay there till you leave. <laughs> But what he means by that is, don't look for a better house. Whoever takes you in, be with them. Somebody once tried to quote St. Paul saying, I can be with the rich and I can be with the poor, but I prefer the rich. No. Whatever house you're invited to, you stay in that. Don't start looking around for better deals. Now, even this was never common this kind of arrangement, this kind of idealism that is presented in this gospel. Already by the second century, in a wonderful little book on the teaching, the Didache, it, it, it alters, it says, only stay two days at a house. I guess some people, you know, spent the summer. I don't know what they did. But there were ways they had to make adjustments. So this is not as realistic as, as we could, could really have it. But there's the ideal. The ideal is, this is what you should do. And, and people will listen to you to the extent that you walk the talk. That's pretty obvious, huh? So what are the points I want to make? The first one is that we are chosen. You've heard the phrase, God's chosen people. I like to say not God's frozen people, but God's chosen people, people who are responsive. You might say, well, I don't really feel chosen. Stop. Christianity, not just Christianity, Judaism and Islam, all teach that we're created in God's image and likeness. Which is to say we should act like God as best we can. We're not God, but we should act like God. And Christianity has the concrete example of a person that we believe is God and still human. So imitable, still able to be a model. And remember, what, what is the great commandment? Obey your priests and pastors? No, the great commandment is love the Lord your God with your whole heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Commandment is love. That's the core. So we're chosen to be lovers. That's the challenge. And, and we're chosen, therefore, we're chosen for great things. I had a, a dear aunt, Aunt Margaret, my father's side of the family. She was Protestant. She went to Defiance College and up in northwestern Ohio, had a degree. Uh, 1920, she got the degree. She was unusual because she would always say to me and my brother, do something adventurous. You know, go on the road, hitchhike across the country. My mother would roll her eyes. But she was always, in a good sense, an enabler. She wanted to make things happen. And she herself lived a rather striking life. She was unusual in that regard. So the first thing is, we're chosen. I, I'm not really sure most of us think that. Why do I say that? There's a tendency within Catholicism to isolate being chosen as being a priest or a religious. Really, that's, that's a tendency. And we're partly responsible for that distortion because we haven't canonized many ordinary people, married people with children. Thank God there's a process going on to canonize Dorothy Day, who got pregnant, had an abortion, marriage failed, and then turned the ship around and dedicated her life. She was mentioned by Pope Francis in his address to Congress, as was Martin Luther King, a womanizer, but a great prophet, as was Thomas Merton, 
who anguished about its vocation as a monk, as was Abraham Lincoln, who at the beginning of the Civil War thought African Americans should be sent back to their home country. Ordinary people with struggles are chosen. We are all chosen. Let that percolate for a little while. If I were in a grade school classroom, I'd say to you, repeat after me, I am chosen. Repeat after me, I am chosen. No, don't do it. But, <laughs> but I'm serious. I'm serious about it. Second thing, we're sent. We're sent. Summoned and sent. Some of us feel like we spend most of our lives in a fog. What do you mean I'm sent? I can't even figure what I ought to do. You know how that is. And a lot of the issues that we face are not black and white. They're gray. They're trade-offs. How to speak to somebody you're estranged from and not make it worse. How to communicate with someone that you never liked and try to be decent without being phony. There are all kinds of situations that we face that are not easy. But we are sent. We are sent to do things. We might say, who? Me? Yes, you and me. For a long time, I fought my calling. It's a no way, Jose. I didn't think it was going to be. It couldn't be. And I gave a lot of good reasons. Moral failings. I said, it's not going to work. They think I'm holy. I am not. I don't think you are either. But you're sent and you're called, as was I. Amos worked in the fields, trimmed trees. Paul, a rabbi. Jesus, just a carpenter. Peter, a fisherman. Mother Teresa, Dorothy Day, people that if you, if, if they heard this sermon from me, my guess is that they heard the sermon from me, they'd say, right. I don't want you to say, right. I want you to ask yourself, if I'm called, how am I sent? My last point is, it's kind of like an adventure, a serious adventure. I always say, anybody that finds Christianity boring, it's because they haven't tried to live it. I'm serious about that. There's a great part of the first of the Narnia series, Lion, Witch, and Wardrobe, where the children are talking with Mr. and Mrs. Beaver about Aslan. Aslan, who's a lion, a great lion. And the question is, well, you know, what, what about this lion? What, what is he like? You know, he's the, he's the lion of Judah. And they go on and they say, this guy is really something. And, and finally, they're worried because they get a little bit frightened. And I, I grabbed this text this morning and it says, oh, I thought, I thought he, was, he was just a man. Uh, and then she says, is he quite safe? And in a very British way, I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. That you will, dearie, make no mistake, said Mrs. Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without feeling threatened, uh, they're just silly. Then Lucy asks, is he safe? This is the great answer. Safe, Mr. Beaver says. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver just told you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. But he's good. God is not safe, but he's good. You want proof? Look at the crucifix. <laughs> it's not safe. You know that joke about, you know, look what they did when he didn't know his math and they nailed him to the cross and so on. There's something here. If you want to be safe, if you want to have everything secure, if religion for you is a way to make sure that everything goes the way you want, then you have domesticated God. Then you have put him in a cage so that he can't really come out and stir the pot. And that's what we need to have happen. 
We're all chosen. We are sent. And we're called to an adventure. But most importantly, we're not alone. We're not alone. I won't go into the second reading, but if you look at the second reading from Ephesians 10 times, 10 times in that short reading we just had, it, see, it speaks of being in him, not at a distance from him, not just following him, not just next to me, but in me. Christ is in me by baptism and then soon by the Eucharist. This is extraordinary. This is good news. Are you ready to take a risk to be sent? Think of one thing you could do that would be a good thing to do that's a little out of the ordinary that should be done and that you're capable of doing. That's a step that embodies being chosen and being sent. Be that way because that's how the church lives. And that's good news. Amen.